you enjoy my videos and want to help my little channel out, then please like, subscribe, and share my videos. Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Wingleboard. In our last exciting episode... In the case of five-month-old Jenna Lynn, Matt, you are not the father. Oh, what did I tell you, bro? Uh, sorry about that. No, in our last exciting episode, I showed you the bottom half of my top 20 Genesis games. If you've been dying a little bit inside every day as you impatiently wait for the rest of my list, well... Good news, everyone! Here it comes right now. Yes, you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll raise your fists in anger, and you'll pound them on the table as I neglect your absolute favorite Genesis games just to make you angry. But seriously, this is my own personal list like I said last time. It will almost definitely be different from your personal top 20 list. If you want to share your top 10 or 20 Genesis games, well, go ahead, I won't stop you. I mean, how could I? With that said, on with the list! While jumping and ninjutsuing into the number 10 spot in the list, we have Shinobi 3. There are three Shinobi games on the Genesis. Revenge of Shinobi, Shadow Dancer, and Shinobi 3. Shadow Dancer is the odd game out in that it features the arcade Shinobi style of gameplay. Shinobi 3, meanwhile, is the sequel to Revenge of Shinobi, and is basically a souped-up modernization of that game's playstyle with lots of improvements. Shinobi 3 was a later release for the Genesis, and it shows. The game features very high quality graphics and animation, smooth and fast gameplay, lots of different actions and moves, a great soundtrack, and lots of digitized sound effects. Basically, Shinobi 3 has all the things that utterly exemplify the type of stuff that came out during the Genesis's prime. It even bridges the different playstyles of the arcade and revenge games a little bit with certain enemies, like the sword throwing shield guys. Some people prefer revenge to Shinobi 3. I can't help but feel sorry for them, and hope that they recover from whatever caused them to have that delusion. There, there, it'll get better, okay? But seriously, Revenge was a great game in its day, but it hasn't aged nearly as well as Shinobi 3, and its play mechanics are a little too simple. It arguably has the better soundtrack, but beyond that, Shinobi 3 is superior in every other way. I mean, come on, this game even has several moments that are evocative of Strider. Plus you get to ride a horsey. I think this is easily the best of the 16-bit Shinobi titles. Spinning into and breaking up the wall leading to the number 9 spot on the list is the very first Sonic the Hedgehog. I know there'll be people out there screaming, No! Sonic 2 is the best! Or No! Sonic 3 is the best! Well, I can only say, this is my list, not yours. I've played way more of the first Sonic game over the years than any of its sequels. Sure, I can appreciate the graphical and gameplay upgrades in the later games, but to me, even without the spin dash or extra shields, there's just something that makes Sonic 1 extra special. There really weren't any other platform games quite like Sonic when it came out, and several game companies tried to copy its playstyle after its release. In Sonic, you had gigantic levels that you could either zip through as fast as possible, or explore if you wanted to try and collect all the rings and gain extra lives. It had a really unique look, excellent graphics, and memorable music. It introduced one of the most popular characters in the history of all gaming, what's not to love? Yeah, yeah, having three levels in each area instead of two like the later games can make it feel like you're in one type of area for a little bit too long. The sequels also added that spin dash I talked about in the various shield power-ups and other characters, which helped change things up a bit and make them more varied. The three other mainline Sonic titles on the Genesis are all really good games but I feel like this one was more innovative and had a much more lasting impact than the others, and is still absolutely worth playing today. Nervously jumping and trying to stick the landing into place number 8 is none other than Landstalker. Climax's game was often compared to Zelda at the time of its release. It has a few similarities, but it's really more of its own thing. It has its roots with old computer and console isometric puzzle games, but wraps that puzzly gameplay around an RPG-like story and experience with real-time combat. Landstalker is one incredible looking Genesis game. The animation is amazingly good, and the graphics in general are very clean and very detailed. Most of the music is really good except for a few tracks that fall squarely into the so-so category. The game is filled with charm, 
has loads of hidden things to find, a pretty lengthy quest, and reasonable difficulty. On the downside, yeah, making some of those jumps is harder than it should be with the isometric viewpoint and the lack of color and shading to help differentiate where platforms actually are in the faux 3D space. But other than that, it's basically a masterpiece. Even with the occasionally frustrating jumping issues, I still wholeheartedly recommend that any serious adventure fan gives it a whirl. Why? Because I'm evil and enjoy seeing people suffer. <laughs> but seriously, Landstalker certainly isn't a perfect game, but it's so good you absolutely shouldn't miss it. Stick with it and you'll be glad you did. Sliding, shooting, and throwing its way into 7th place is Gunstar Heroes! Treasure's first big game was crafted by a bunch of ex-Konami employees who were just sick to death of making the same games, like Contra, over and over again. So, for one of their first releases, they put out a game like Contra. Oh, who cares about a little hypocrisy when the game is so great? Gunstar Heroes is basically a slightly more cartoony looking version of Contra that includes some special melee attacks and grappling. And bosses. Lots and lots of bosses. Treasure also filled it with a plethora of fancy graphical effects that weren't too common on the Genesis before this game came out. You've got multi-layer smooth full-screen rotation, lots of warping and stretching, simulated 3D effects, tons of sprites, and huge characters thrown around. And of course, two-player simultaneous action, you know, if you're into that. I think Gunstar Heroes fairly easily bests Contra Hardcore as the best running gun game on the Genesis. I feel like it's more fun to play, offers a good challenge without being too difficult, and also looks and sounds better than Konami's game as well. But that board game level? Man, Treasure, come on! Fluidly flipping onto a wall and climbing into the number 6 slot, we have Strider! This game came out just about a year after the release of the Genesis. Sega had already done an excellent if somewhat scaled down port of Capcom's Ghouls and Ghosts, which had been awarded EGM's Game of the Year in 1989. They took the reprogramming reins again for Capcom's Strider, and how did they do? Completely awesome, that's how! Oh, and they also snagged another EGM Game of the Year award for Strider in 1990. Strider isn't a perfect arcade conversion. The Genesis has a lower resolution, fewer colors, fewer sprites, and fewer background layers than Capcom's CPS-1 hardware. But you know what? Sega got about as close as anyone could have possibly dreamed to that arcade version when they released this game in 1990. Everything from the arcade game is here in some form, and it's a really close conversion that only the nitpickiest of nitpickers will pick nits from. This was, and is, a seriously great conversion. Strider is another game I still play many, many times a year. I probably play the Genesis version more than the arcade one, but I still play them both a lot. What could I say, I love them both. It's a game that seems really tough and complicated when you first pick it up, but as you come to grips with its unique gameplay, it all becomes second nature and you can zoom through a complete game in about 12 to 15 minutes. Still absolutely amazing today. Hot dukening its way into the 5 spot is none other than Street Fighter 2 Special Champion Edition. In the dark days when Street Fighter 2 was an SNES exclusive, Sega fans the world over thought they'd never get to play a version on their console of choice. Then, one day, news came that Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition was being ported to the Genesis by Capcom. All the 16-bit era versions of Street Fighter 2 crop the game vertically and have black bars above and below the image. Capcom, when they showed the first screenshots of Champion Edition for the Genesis while it was in development, had moved the game image to the bottom of the screen and took the health bars out of the game image and stuck them in the unused black area that was now all above the screen. This outraged game fans back in those days who demanded to have their black bars both above and below the image. Street Fighter II Special Champion Edition was the final result of what we ended up with on the Genesis. It's a port of both Champion Edition and Street Fighter 2 Turbo. You choose which one you want to play. The graphics were ported over from the SNES game, 
but were a little low res and drab because of that. If only Sega had handled this port themselves. The gameplay with a fancy new Genesis 6 button controller was outstanding. No more having to mess around with moving and reassigning buttons like some other consoles. As far as sound goes, the voices rightly got flack for being too garbled, but hey, at least the music is excellent and in most cases very similar to the arcade version of the same tracks. I still play this version of the game fairly often these days. It's just a cute little version of the arcade game that managed to have its own charm because of its shortcomings. Obviously, the arcade one looks and sounds way better, but I still play that one too, and I do often come back to this one. Try it if you haven't. Just stay away from the Genesis Super Street Fighter 2. Blech! Crawling its way into fourth place on my list is my absolute favorite horizontal shooter on the Genesis, Thunder Force 3. It's hard for me to describe just how awesome this game was when it came out. Thunder Force 2 was a pretty decent launch window title for the Genesis and was suitably arcade-like, but Thunder Force 3 just ratchets everything up to a completely different level. Thunder Force 3 loses the overhead stages of the first two games and is the better for it. It incorporates multiple layers of parallax scrolling and funky line scrolling effects to give it an impressive visual style. The music, well, it's another one of the absolute best soundtracks on the Genesis, and my favorite soundtrack for the whole series. It's so good. The gameplay is also rock solid, if a little bit easy compared to the other entries in the series. Uh, alright, it's a lot easier than the other ones, even on Mania, but that doesn't make it bad. This game was so good that it made the jump from the Genesis to the arcade. That's right, it was released in the arcades as Thunder Force AC with some tweaks and level changes that made the game worse. It was further tweaked with more level changes and other changes that made it worse and released on the SNES as Thunder Spirits. And that version, I have to say, is pretty terrible and should be avoided. If you like shooters or action games, absolutely give this one a try. If you're new to shooters, hey, it's also a great one to start with because it's easier than most of them. Strategically battling into third place on my list is Shining Force 2. This is the sequel to, you'll never guess, Shining Force. Shining Force was a great strategy RPG and the sequel is even better, enhancing basically every element of the first game. Shining Force 2 has more characters, the parties are larger, there are more classes, graphics are a little bit nicer, and music is a lot nicer, and the gameplay is still really fast and breezy for a game in the genre. Shining Force 2 is also a pretty long game and is full of hidden things to uncover throughout, including characters that it's possible to entirely miss. The one thing that maybe doesn't work so great is that unlike the first game, in this one, you can actually walk around on some maps to travel between areas, and during those travels, you can get into random encounters. These battles seem okay at first, but they quickly become not worth the time and effort, as your characters level up enough through mandatory encounters. They should have found some other method for optional fights if you needed to boost your levels a little bit. Still, Shining Force 2 is an excellent game. If you're a big fan of regular JRPGs and haven't tried any strategy RPGs, this is the perfect game to start with. It shares a lot of common elements with genre heavyweights like Fire Emblem and Final Fantasy Tactics, but is much more accessible thanks to its somewhat simpler and faster gameplay. Like most of the Shining Force games, this one also features full towns to explore in normal JRPG fashion. I can't recommend this game enough. Try it out, it's great! Traveling through space and landing at number two on my list is the best JRPG on the standalone Genesis, Sega's own Fantasy Star 4. This game was the final entry in the traditional JRPG style of the first four mainline Fantasy Star games. Since this game came out in 1994 in Japan and 1995 in the US, there hasn't been another traditional Fantasy Star, and that is incredibly sad if you ask me. Sad. This entry has links to all three prior games in the series, which was something that was pretty uncommon back around the time of its release. There are even direct references to the black sheep of the series, Phantasy Star 3. Phantasy Star 4 looks great, 
has music that mostly falls in the good to great range, an engaging story, cool anime style cutscenes, and awesome turn based JRPG combat. In addition to that, your characters walk really fast, you get access to a bunch of vehicles, travel across multiple planets, visit loads of locations, and you can even set combat macros for commonly used actions and combine certain actions to make special attacks. The game is a good length but doesn't track your gameplay time. I'd estimate it takes between 30 and 40 hours depending on how lost you get and whether or not you do the optional stuff, of which there is plenty. Fantasy Star 4 is the bittersweet swan song of the mainline Fantasy Star series, and I would highly recommend it not just to all JRPG fans, but video game fans in general. And even though the game does have story links to the prior games in the series, it's not necessary for you to have played through those to enjoy this one. Really, they're just sort of fun callbacks for those who have. Fantasy Star 4 is one of my top three 16-bit console JRPGs, and I can't recommend it enough. Here we are at number one, folks. Uno, the big O-N-E. Punching, kicking, suplexing, flipping, and throwing its way all the way to the absolute top of my list is none other than Streets of Rage 2. Not exactly a controversial choice, I know, but I've been a huge fan of this game ever since I got it for Christmas the year that it came out. I still fondly remember my younger brother and I spending hours playing it that day and finishing it that night. Since then, I've finished the game many, many more times. What makes Streets of Rage 2 so great? Glad you asked. The graphics are top-notch, the music is some of the best ever in a Genesis game, the gameplay is fun and full of variety thanks to the many moves available to your characters, and it's got four pretty different playable characters to choose from. The game is long without being too long, and challenging enough to be fun without being frustrating. The environments are varied and it feels like this game is just about as polished as a Genesis game could possibly be. Yeah, if you play it to the end and just try and take out every enemy in the same exact way, it can become a bit monotonous. But the game gives you so many options for combat, I don't see why anyone would ever want to even play it like that. In the almost 30 years that I've been playing this game, I can't recall ever starting it without finishing it, and I've played it a lot. Streets of Rage 2 is easily the best scrolling fighter to appear on a 16-bit home console in my opinion. It does so much, so well, but how could it have ended up anywhere other than at the very top of my list? The simple answer is that it couldn't have, so it didn't. Streets of Rage 2 is my number one Genesis game, and it's well deserved. Looks like that's the end of my top 20 Genesis game list. Who could have possibly imagined that this would end after all 20 games were covered? What's that you say? Everyone? Touché. But it was actually kind of difficult to put this list together, and it is by no means definitive, and it could even change over time. I don't think the games themselves on the list would change, but their position might shift a little bit. I really feel this is a good representation of the games that I either liked the best or thought were the most influential. I could have easily made this a top 50 Genesis game list, but, you know, I had to put the cutoff somewhere. And now it is time. Time to end the video. I know, I know, but look, we all knew this time had to come, didn't we? All you can do now is tell me what your favorite 20 Genesis games are in the comments below. Or, you know, yell at me for not including your favorite Genesis game which I obviously did strictly to antagonize you. With that, I will say thanks for watching, and see me later.